Okay, hello everybody. It's one o'clock, one o'clock in Germany, and I welcome all of you, um, our speakers here virtually, virtually here um, today, and the online audience to our FFB T on Point webinar, displaced and disconnected, uh, Rohingya refugee search for a future in Bangladesh and beyond. Um, this is a webinar in a, in a series um, that is embedded. Uh, within the FFBT project, uh, which stands for Forced Migration and Refugee Studies, Networking and Knowledge Transfer, a project funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, BMBF, joint project by BIC, the Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies, for whom I work, the Center for Human Rights, Erlangen Nuremberg um, at the University of Erlangen, the German Institute for Development and Sustainability, IDOS, and the Institute for Migration Research and Intercultural Studies, EMIS, at the University of Osnabrück. Um, this wider project aims to strengthen interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, research on issues of forced migration and displacement in Germany and beyond. Um, and we hope to yeah, foster um, networks and contacts between academia and policy decision makers and with the wider public. Uh, with our project, we also seek to contribute to global debates on displacement. And we also wish to provide opportunities for international fellows from diverse countries to contribute to our academic and our more practice oriented networks. Uh, more info is on the on the website FFBT and net. Uh, my name is Benjamin Edsold. Um, I'm a social geographer and migration scholar. I've been working at BICC um, for the last um, six years or so, mainly on issues of migration and displacement. Last couple of years, I led an EU-funded research project um, on the transnational dimension of displacement, um, which was particularly focused on the notion of protracted displacement, so long-term, long-standing, um, difficult-to-resolve displacement situations. Um, and in our research project, we had no case study on um, displacement of Rohingyas or the situation in Bangladesh or in Southeast Asia. Um, but I was always curious to learn much more about that and felt it's importantly, um, highly important to address um, yeah, displacement from Myanmar and bring this um, debate also to the wider attention of the um, audience um, in Europe. I will say a few more about the aims of our webinar in a second. First, some technicalities. So we'll have now um, uh, roughly 90 minutes um, in, in, the, in the webinar, um, almost. Um, uh, we have um, four great speakers present here. Um, Shabira Sultana Nupur from the International Rescue Committee, Halash Kamruzaman from the University of South Wales, Anash Ansar from the University of Bonn, and Antje Misbach from the University um, of Bielefeld. You in the so to the content of what we are uh, wanting to do today. Uh, I think many of us are well aware that the Rohingyas re represent one of the most persecuted ethnic and religious minority groups in Southeast Asia. And there is a long history of their displacement from Myanmar. Um, this became particularly evident in August 2017, when after successive phases of stated violence and oppression, around 750,000 Rohingyas fled um, to Bangladesh. Most found protection in Cox's Bazar district, right in the south uh, southeast um, of Bangladesh, where also refugees from earlier cycles of displacement had already lived. In total, currently, there's an estimated or measured by UNHCR numbers um, population of Rohingyas um, of around 950,000 persons uh, living in Bangladesh. The, one of the temporary settlements, Kuta um, Palong, is one of the largest and probably most densely populated refugee camps uh, on earth. And it is well noted sort of that the government of Bangladesh, uh, local communities, international organizations, they provide essential humanitarian aid um, to the displaced Rohingyas. And this to somewhat, some extent helps to ease the crisis that unfolded rapidly five years ago. Um, but it also shows um, yeah, five years after this large scale displacement, there doesn't seem to be a real solution in sight, a durable solution in the jargon um, of, yeah, of the protection debate, no durable solution in sight for the displaced Rohingyas. So you might say there's an increasingly bleak situation for displaced Rohingyas in South and Southeast Asia. Um, 
just a few days ago, for instance, also um, on Al Jazeera, there was a report um, on increased return, uh, forced return movements from Myanmar um, to um, from Malaysia back to back to Myanmar. And UNHCR has warned um, the international community to enhance the protection and, and, and warned against um, pushing people um, to return to the conditions to which from to which they once had to flee. Um, but we will address a range uh, of questions today in this in this webinar. One of the first questions that I'd be interested in is sort of why do you think why and how has this what was first an emergency of Rohingya displacement turned into a protracted displacement situation? What could and also should stakeholders have done differently? And which realistic options are at hand for stakeholders to ease the crisis of displacement? Would also be interesting to hear more about relocation within Bangladesh and resettlement to third countries and what role this actually plays in current strategies to this crisis. But we also note sort of, um, yeah, sort of that so far resettlement efforts or so have been very minimal. Um, return seems to be unrealistic at the moment. Local integration hindered many fronts. Um, then the question arises what alternative and maybe complementary pathways to reaching durable solutions can be followed. Last not least, and I think most importantly, sort of which solutions are preferred by the displaced Rohingyas themselves? And what strategies do people who had to flee and who had to live um, in camp situations for years and years, what do they see um, and how do are they how do, are they trying to achieve um, yeah, a pathway to a better, better future? Okay, so let us start um, and let me introduce of the first speaker. I, each speaker now has about um, 10 minutes or so for an initial initial input. Um, and we'll have then the discussion uh, with the Q&A afterwards. So let me first uh, introduce you Shabira Sultana Nupur, who's working as a head of advocacy and communication with the International Rescue Committee in Bangladesh. Um, from the very beginning of the Rohingya influx, um, Nupur um, has been involved in advocacy work um, and response in a response, a refugee response in Bangladesh. She's also a child protection and uh, participation advocacy expert working for more than 25 years in this field. Um, she also sits on a global strategy committee on girls, not brides. Um, and I know, uh, Nupur, you can say a few more words about that. Um, she has a degree in political science from National University in Bangladesh and on governance and public policy from the University of Dhaka. Um, Nupur is in Cox Bazar at the moment, where RSC is working directly with displaced communities. So could you maybe as a start, give us a quick overview of the situation of displaced Rohingyas in Bangladesh, and maybe also introduce the work of IRC for displaced people and local communities in Bangladesh. Uh, maybe it would be also great if you point to some limitations or barriers you are confronted with in your work. We're looking forward to listening to you. Thank you so much. When you covered everything, I think you covered on or most of my points in your sharing. So, uh, hello everyone. Good afternoon from uh, Bangladesh, especially right now. I am in Cox's Bazar, where the humanitarian crisis is happening, and uh, IRC Bangladesh. Uh, we are uh, we are we are implementing our program in both communities, the Rohingya and host community. And I would like to start from yesterday's experience. Like last night, we had a pretty big cyclone in Bangla, in Cox's Bazar and southern part of Bangladesh. And we couldn't sleep all night because we had to communicate here and there to know the situation, what is happening on ground. and. And thankfully, uh, uh, a big damages uh, didn't happen uh, uh, because uh, the wind was not that much strong and there are no heavy rainfall. And due to the, these two regions, uh, uh, big damages uh, didn't happen in Cox's Bazar at the same time in our southern part. But yet, um, we don't have uh, updated data now at this moment. Uh, the assessment going on. Uh, maybe uh, by tomorrow morning, we will have the uh, whole scenario in our hand. Uh, 
if anyone interested then i can share with ben and ben may share with all of you but till um, uh, till now we have data in less than 24 hours uh, 47 shelters in cox's bazar were damaged not fully but partially and uh, 2251 individuals were affected by the cyclone uh, especially in five camps and those are in the uh, top of the hills actually uh, but at the same time uh, uh, during the monsoon time the rains uh, butter flimsy bamboo and tarpaulin shelters because all shelters are uh, made by uh, tarpaulin and bamboo and uh, monsoon or heavy rain very often cause water logging and shelter damage when rains continue the water often has now to go Increasing risks of disease and pro, uh, pro, uh, probabilities of landslides. Uh, last year, uh, there were a, a, a big flood uh, in camps in August 2021. And during that flood, the total 87,617 refugees were affected and uh, more than 25,000 refugees were displaced uh, due to that flood. At the same time, there were a massive fire on uh, in camp on March 2021. Uh, that uh, fire left 15 refugees dead and displaced over 48,000 uh, Rohingya refugees in camps, and they were uh, they were um, under the open sky. And especially women and girls were at risk of um, uh, sexual and uh, physical violences. Uh, you, we all know already been shared. Uh, it has been uh, six years running on uh, of this uh, Rohingya immigrant crisis. And uh, at this moment, around 1 million Rohingya refugees live in Cox's Bazar, which is uh, in the last uh, largest refugee camp in the world. Uh, there was a uh, influx in, two in 2017 August, and over 70, 730,000 Rohingya fled their homes in Rakhine State, uh, joining those already in Bangladesh. And uh, almost most of them walked for a days uh, through jungles and mountains and braved uh, dangerous sea voyages uh, to across the Bay of Bengal uh, to reach uh, camps in Cox's Bazar. And now they have nothing but need everything. And almost um, all of uh, almost most of families uh, have a terrible experiences uh, in their homeland, and almost most of the families uh, lost their uh, loved ones or um, injured uh, 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 who are alive and living in camps. Living conditions for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh are poor and worsening. We all know that through media and maybe we visited camps. Uh, Rohingya have few job opportunities uh, and little access uh, to formal education. Uh, and crime, violence, including killings of Rohingya community leaders are on the rise. Camps are extremely overcrowded and the quality of shelters is really poor, as I just mentioned earlier. IRC, we, already, we, we regularly produce protection monitoring data, uh, protection monitoring report based on our protection monitoring data, and that data shows uh, persistent issues of psychological distress and domestic abuse. At the same time, abduction, killing, rape, use of uh, firearms and drug peddling, uh, among other crimes, have emerged as major concern in maintaining law and order at the refugee camps in, in, in Cox's budget. Uh, recent target killing to the Rohingya leaders, uh, Mobi, you, we, all of we heard about the about killing of Mr. Mohibullah to the situation in more complex way. Uh, Rohingya youth leaders um, and activi activists uh, uh, said that the frustration over non repatriation to Myanmar, lack of job opportunities, absence of transparency in the selection of their machi, of their leaders, uh, they, we call machi uh, in uh, in. Rohingya refugee camp, among others, are key regions uh, Rohingya youths get involved in criminal activities. In response to insecurity, the government of Bangladesh has tightened security in camps and cons cons constrained refugees' freedom of movement. The government of Bangladesh has limited refugees' ability to come and go from the camps and cut off access to mobile internet and attempt to restrain mixing uh, with locals. Uh, the situation of women and um, uh, adolescent girls also not in good shape. Uh, IRC, we produce uh, gender-based violence every year. Uh, already three reports produced on gender-based violence since 2019. 
and as per those reports, uh, at least one, one in four women and girls screened at IRC health centers and women's centers reported that they were survivors of gender-based violence. Due to the significant cultural, uh, social, societal, and legal barriers, survivors face uh, these levels are assessed to be a significant underreporting. At the same time, uh, rape, uh, rape case is really, really high, but uh, uh, due to the, as I mentioned, due to the uh, stigma uh, and social taboo, uh, the reporting rate is really low. And this rape and uh, sexual uh, violence or molestation happened uh, when they go, they means women and adolescent girls go to collect uh, water uh, and very often uh, water uh, facilities are, are pretty bit far from their shelters. And after, especially these things happen after uh, 4 p.m. when all agencies uh, leave or left um, uh, refugee camps. And uh, that time they faced uh, molestation by their by their community men or or from host communities, uh, but they don't uh, feel comfortable to report uh, as uh, the inadequate legal service and the and they don't feel comfortable to go to authorities and to their community leaders uh, to report. Very often they don't get justice. Uh, at the same time, uh, tensions are there among uh, host and Rohingya refugees, uh, Rohingya refugee communities over land, resources, and labor access. Members of the host community feel that the Rohingya communities' use of resources and land, such as the chopping of firewood and the strains on local livelihoods and pay caused by Rohingya informal livelihoods, are all having a negative impact on host community access and exacerbating tensions between the communities. Please note that when uh, when uh, the influx happened, the local communities was there in the first place uh, who provided uh, food, shelter, and clothes or everything. But uh, days are going passing by, and uh, they are they are here, and host community are uh, getting anxious and restless uh, about the whole situation. And these uh, findings uh, came out in our study report. Uh, the name is Strengthening Connection. I can share the report uh, later with Ben. Uh, education skill development, this is an issue in camps. Um, uh, though government uh, uh, agreement, there was a big agreement with government to pilot the use of Myanmar curriculum, but the rollout has been extremely, extremely uh, slow. Uh, the rollout should be expanded to the 400,000 school age children, including the 100,000 who currently do not attend the school. Teaching is providing uh, through almost 3,500 uh, learning centers, but uh, during the uh, pandemic time, uh, those learning centers are closed and, uh, and, and children and young people, adults and young are out of uh, education. Uh, uh, younger, uh, my, you know, for education, uh, we will we'll require longer term funding. Uh, currently, as per the JAP, uh, currently education sector is just 10% funded. Investment is better uh, quality teaching facilities and support to teacher training. Uh, and uh, we, we must uh, focus on this area. Skill development is another issue. Uh, youth communities uh, and, uh, uh, and doing at, at most Rohingya communities, they are not allowed to take part in any income generating activities or skill development activities, though this section is, uh, is a prioritized activity in the uh, joint response plan in 2020. Uh, a policy, a, also a policy on skill development and training for refugee and host communities was developed in 2020, but it has not yet been implemented. And uh, we don't, at this moment, we don't have any confirmation like when this policy can be implemented and they can take part in income generating uh, activities or skill development uh, program. Uh, Vashanchar, another issue. Uh, till today, uh, 30,000 refugee, uh, Rohingya refugees have been relocated uh, by the government of Bangladesh uh, and uh, they build the infrastructure for 100,000 Rohingya refugees and gradually they will relocate that number to Vashanchar. The last relocation happened uh, on 16 October uh, 2022, around uh, 1,000 uh, Rohingya refugees relocated to Vashanchar. Uh, limited services are there. Those who relocated uh, were promised uh, a range of services, including education, like health and the livelihoods. However, uh, from different sources uh, uh, the, from the island suggest uh, services are either limited or unavailable. Uh, in response to this condition, there continue um, to be reports of Rohingya refugees escaping the island, many of whom are caught um, uh, by policy and uh, policy on return to Cox's budget. 
Funding also is declining uh, uh, in this crisis uh, as per, uh, as, per uh, uh, as of September 2022, uh, as per the JRP, uh, the worst cl uh, cluster just received 1.6 uh, uh, funded funded, uh, education cluster 9.9% .9 funded, protection sector is funded to 25% of requirements, uh, which include gender-based violence up, up to 2021. And that's the DBB subsector was also reported on separately, but it no longer fits on OCHAS reporting. Food security is the best funded sector at 40% of requirements, but funding gaps are now being uh, compounded by rising uh, food price because um, in our countries, okay, some crises are going on and food price is really hiking. And with money coming, it's not buying as much food in support. Um, uh, there are research uh, by uh, human uh, uh, or I, uh, International Rescue Committee, and uh, he, he, uh, let me see the name. And humanitarian uh, policy group, uh, the name report name is uncertain uh, features. And there are another study, uh, regional study by uh, United uh, UNS ACR. Uh, they consulted uh, with Rohingya refugees and uh, to know uh, how they feel uh, about the repatriation or condition in boxes, uh, yeah, in uh, in their homeland, and the Rohingya refugee community, they raise five key issues that create the conditions uh, conducive to their return. Uh, because whenever we talk to Rohingya refugee communities, uh, they express their uh, dream that uh, they uh, ultimate goal is they would like to go back to their motherland. That's the ultimate destination for them. Uh, so they are they required five. Um, uh, issue, uh, issues like uh, their safety and security to be granted, uh, their right to citizenship to be recognized and identity document uh, showing evidence of their Myanmar nationality. They want to return to li li live and work on the same land their parents and grandparents lived, uh, freedom of movement to access decent work, services and livelihoods, equal access to education like other communities in Myanmar. If five things ensured uh, in Myanmar in their Rakhine state, then they would like to go back to their uh, motherland as soon as possible. But the situation we all know in Myanmar is not supportive. And uh, there are fighting going on uh, near uh, uh, opposite the uh, uh, border of Myanmar. And uh, some water shell is uh, they, are, they are throwing and, uh, and uh, in Bangladesh. And uh, last two, two weeks back on uh, on. Uh, uh, um, Rohingya refugee young uh, di uh, di died and some also injured. And this thing happening frequently in our uh, in our party and border area. So this is alarming uh, from uh, from uh, from from our end in uh, in this crisis. And also uh, uh, administrative uh, burden are there. Uh, like we are not, uh, we means not only IRC but also agencies. We don't get approval on uh, on on de de on uh, projects, grants project for long term, like six months or or one year. We get approval, and it takes longer time. Uh, and who is really uh, uh, stopped us to provide uh, as service as much as I, we can to the Rohingya refugees and the local communities, and. Uh, and there are some other administrative challenges we are having, uh, not, only, uh, not only IRC also, but also other agencies in camps uh, to implement projects. Uh, regarding the settle resettlement, uh, there are agenda when um, when uh, the, this influx happened, uh, some countries express uh, uh, about the, uh, about the resettlement uh, issues, but uh, uh, they didn't show their experience. Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, interested to take uh, a large number of Rohingya refugees, so government declined that uh, agenda. Uh, but now uh, we are having a conversation in country that uh, US, uh, USA and other uh, countries may uh, take a uh, number of Rohingya refugees uh, from Bangladesh to there, uh, but uh, uh, didn't have any particular uh, exact number, uh, how many Rohingya refugees can go there, and didn't start any official process yet uh, from uh, Bangladesh side. Uh, but uh, uh, we are expecting government will consider uh, the resettlement issues. But th at this time, uh, uh, from a crisis perspective and the, the for, and the and the future of Rohingya refugees, uh, they they should uh, get 
chance or get access to education, skill development, or livelihood activities so that they can survive and they can develop their skill and they can uh, contribute when they will back to their uh, 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 community. So I can stop here. Uh, if you have any co particular question, then I can uh, add detail. Over okay. to you, Benny. Okay, um, Donobat uh, Nupur, um, thanks for the great um, overview um, of the yeah very deeply worrying um, uh, situations, deeply worrying what you um, what you told us, um, but also much appreciated of the, the multiple efforts uh, that are being taken to um, yeah in, improve uh, improve might be a strange word, but um, to to ease the situation to some to some extent. Um, I won't comment on the many, many different dimensions that you pointed to right now, um, but um, we will leave that to later, but uh, move on to uh, Palash Kamruzaman, who is a professor of social policy and director of the Center for Social Policy at the University of South Wales in Cardiff, from where he joins us today, um, before he held positions at the University of Bath, Leicester, Nottingham, Liverpool, and Independent University of Bangladesh. Um, he um, currently leads a British Academy funded research project that aims to explore the experience of violence and loss of dignity among forcibly displaced Rohingyas in Bangladesh. And in another project, he also is exploring perceptions of local host communities who are sheltering refugees. So he has been in the region many times and done a lot of interviews um, with displaced people himself. Um, he has been also a fellow um, in our FFBT project at BIC, um, and actually this webinar is part of one of the outcomes of, of, his, uh, of his fellowship uh, with us. Um, so Palash, you have heard uh, Nupur's presentation of the current situation and their work and the challenges they face. And of course, you've seen the circumstances yourself many times and spoke with many people. So from your perspective, so, you know, why and how has this, you know, emergency turned into such a yeah, protracted dis displacement situation in a situation where yeah, people seem to be going in no particular direction? And maybe, yeah, from your assessment and experience, sort of what could or should have stakeholders also maybe done differently in order, yeah, so that we would be at a different situation now. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> and um Thank you, Nupurapa, um, for providing an um, overall um, situation there. Um, I do not want, I'll try not to repeat anything. So that would be like, you know, probably more productive for us. And um, so, yes, Ben mentioned that, you know, I, 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 I'm not currently leading. I finished that project that was funded from British Academy. That project is finished. Um, all materials is available um, online. So we actually like explored the dignity journey of the Rohingyas, right? So we spoken to them. So we tried to learn from them. Just a short, short background for that. The people talk dignity, even like in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, without current, without properly thinking what dignity means, right? There is no dignified. There is no definition for dignity from the UN or like in any other organization. There's some philosophical conceptualization of dignity, which is rather ambiguous, and um, international treaties does not clarify this. So we went to the like you know, refugee people, in this case Rohingya themselves, to understood that they understand their dignity. So we we demonstrated their jar and um, three layers of dignity. One is like you know the dignity that has suffered from in Myanmar through their journey before they came to Bangladesh. So their dignity, how it is affected or restored in Bangladeshi camps and their hope or aspiration of dignity if at all they want to go back or they are able to go back. In a nutshell, like, you know, what we found that, you know, um, Rohingyas are perfectly capable of identifying what dignity means to them, right? We challenged in our findings, like, you know, what Kant and many other philosophers and the universal declarations tend to talk like the dignity is unviolable. That dignity has been violated, right? And um, it is it is it is a proof, yeah, evidence that is them. So dignity is like the multidisciplinary, the people who are at the bottom. So generally, like you know, our finding was dignity has been seen top down. So we tried to place like in you know, a while about like in you know, a bottom-up approach of dignity in in ensuring in aid and future resolution programs for refugees and this case Rohingya. Very briefly, like you know, Rohingyas were able to identify dignity and hear me out. 
as part of their identity. And that is exactly the reason like you know, where, where they are now because they were not given the identity in Myanmar. The identity was taken for them, from them, right? They were talking about like, you know, dignity in terms of safety. For them, safety is the dignity. People were scared. Their children were scared by the barking of the fox at nighttime in the caps because they have experienced extreme form of violence, right? Religious freedom, again, like you know, religion and identity, their religious identity was the basis of their like you know, persecution, right? And exploitation and like you know, the experiences they have had. So they're like, you know, they think they're still better in the camps because they can perform their religious values and practices. Nuparapa was trying to cover like, you know, the need of formal education. A number of colleagues and scholars have been arguing a generation has, is like, you know, is, is getting lost before our eyes. Yeah, they're not into education. What what will, will they do if in next few years they're they're, go, they're they're able to return? So the place dignity in education and ilm they call ilm wisdom. Ilm means wisdom in the language. Their inability to provide for their family is also visible in this in this way to talk about like the wealth and self reliance. It is dignified to provide being able for their family. And social cohesion, respect to elderly people is also like you know, came to like you know, came in front. So this is something academic, but I would like to straight move on to the question Ben asked me about like, you know, what do I make of the crisis? Like you know, what is a crisis? And then I said that I'll build on like Nupurapa's point. There is a tendency like, you know, that this crisis looked at as if this is a humanitarian crisis. I take a, I take a, I take a deep breath, and I, I'd like to, I'd like to ask everybody: When was a refugee crisis a humanitarian crisis, in including Rohingya crisis? It's purely a political crisis. A group of politicians or a group of people killed, tortured, raped another group of people, and they just ousted this group of people to another country, and this group of people is now being sheltered, and there might have been some form of politics involved as well and sheltered in another country, why they're being sheltered, as I said, that could be political as well. But then they were hoping that these people will go back soon. International community chosen to be kept, remain silent mostly, chosen, deliberately chosen to keep this crisis ongoing. A number of NGOs are there. There is like a huge number of jobs for like you know, foreigners who probably are less experienced than Nupurapa and all these things. So white gauge is also visible in terms of looking at the crisis, how Bangladeshis are trying to resolve this crisis, how Rohingyas are trying and willing to resolve this crisis is an issue. The inability or unwillingness to sanction or you know, do the right thing against Myanmar, Myanmar government, even though there is a military coup is the root cause of the crisis. The silence of some of the major regional power namely India, China, and other, other places, and maybe to some extent Russia, not saying or not doing the right thing against a country that has killed, tortured, raped, and whatnot. The UN fact-finding mission in 2017, I mean, I can go on and on, but just to summarize, UN fact-finding mission tells in their report that this has been a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. If this was the case for any other countries, there would have been huge repercussion on that country. But it's not against Myanmar, right? So in terms of geopolitics, Bangladesh is a smaller country with potentially probably less bargaining power in geopolitics, right? So this is the reason like you know, the crisis has been protracted. There is geopolitical interest involved in Myanmar. And the pay, the price are being paid by these vulnerable people. These people who are people, not numbers, 9,000, 900,000 or 1 million people. They have taken their lives in their hand. They have crossed the river. They faced the bullet. I mean, we have seen many people with injury marks. I could not even eat personally. It is, it is extremely disappointing when you see like some people and I, I find myself and I'd like to make it personal, of course, personally, right? How would I eat when I know that these people are not eating enough and I have enough for me, for my family, and for my daughter, for my wife? Nuparapa was talking like about rape is ongoing. Yes, these people, they have experienced something which is 
traumatic, but now they're involved in like a serious sort of crime themselves. So this is a major security issue. Yeah. So there was recently like a major conference sustaining support for the Rohingya refugee response by some of the leading countries from the donors. So another aspect is donorship. The donors do not want probably, at least currently, any, any quick resolution. If the major countries, if the major countries wanted this to be resolved, I personally do not think Myanmar is in a position to say no to many things. Of course, like you know, the people who have vetoed, people who are protecting Myanmar, and Myanmar is now going to a military coup. Why there is not enough sanction, a strong enough sanction to, to like you know, to make, you know, bow them down to take refugees back. The world is silent, right? Imagine if this was like an you know, Ukrainian refugees. Yeah? You all love Ukrainian refugees. I love them too, but they're not white, unfortunately. They're Muslim, they're not white, they're not in Europe, they're not near to the European shores. That's why people probably are reluctant. And the place where they are being hosted, that country is not very strong, like other countries, for example, Malaysia, who could like you know, kick them back, India, who could kick them back, or Turkey, who can threat European Union, we'll go, we are going to leave our door open so that the refugees in our country can fight your countries. Bangladesh cannot do that, right? So donorship, international negligence, and the like, you know, the ideas of like you know, lack of ideas, the top-down approach is causing this crisis protracted one. There's no denial about this. Let's face it as it is, rather than trying to like you know, make it and give it a scholarly look, right? We try to do a lot of things. In terms of solution, of course, like you know, look, it is easy to say like you know, what I, I'll, I'll share some of my personal experiences when I do research, there are like you know, some people who tend to believe Bangladesh is making a lot of money out of this crisis, right? And Nupurapa, as a worker, you know, as an aid professional, he is clearly saying that there is a decline of like you know, aid money. Obviously, this would be the case. They're not any more donor darling. There will be new crisis elsewhere. They will slowly become donors' orphans. And this is academic terms. These are academic terms, right? There will be less and less of interest because the world will, will find new and newer interest, which needs immediate attention, right? And Bangladesh has been consistently saying, and I, I can quote, I don't need to see my notes. Bangladeshi Prime Minister at the United Nations clearly says that, look, they are, they are becoming a burden. Even in that conference that I mentioned, sustaining support for the Rohingya refugee response, there was not a foreign minister, but there was the state minister who clearly said, and I read, the first thing he said, Bangladesh is not in a position to continue to take this burden anymore. The Rohingya must return to their country of origin as soon as possible. I'll try to use the metaphor. If I'm a guest to somebody else's place, if the guest doesn't want me, can I stay there? How long would I stay there? It is clear Bangladesh government does not want them. Nupurapa was again talking about like the host community's perception. Host community are the first group of people who were there to rescue and help and support the like, you know, dying Rohingyas. And this is evident in many, many studies. The global community need to pay attention how the host community has now almost turned to be hostile. Of course, there are competition for resources. Of course, there are like, you know, lack of understanding, lack of communication. The host community feel that you know, their, their resources are being taken off from them and Rohingyas are like, you know, given like you know, being pampered, put it in, let's put it in this way, where they're not being supported at all, right? Of course, there are competition for daily labors and all these things. Can a solution be sustainable? Can a solution, I mean, until their solution, they need to coexist in a harmonious way, right? Imagine if they become violent, that would be a disaster. Now, Rohingyas have, I'm assuming my other, other speakers will talk about this, Rohingyas are now being vulnerable to trafficking. They're involved in drug peddling. They're involved in terrorist activities. And these are the facts, right? And any crisis, if it goes for five years longer, many Rohingyas, almost everyone we interviewed, they want to return. Don't just think, it would be, it would be unwise to think that they don't understand what's happening. They, perfectly clearly understand that international community has turned their back on them. International community is not giving them enough attention. So what will they do? 
they'll try to go to like in you know, many other like in you know, bigger countries, Europe, America, or at least Indonesia, Malaysia, and other places. The relocation of Rohingyas to Vashancho, I understand this is a political political move from Bangladeshi government to show the world community, look, you did not like it. You forbid us, you forbid us to like you know, to relocate them. We are fed up with you. We'll do whatever you want. And the world cannot do anything, could not do anything. There'll be more and more Rohingyas to be relocated in Mia um, Basancho. Nuparapa was talking about like you know, the um, cyclone yesterday. We probably do not know what has happened there. I just hope all the Rohingyas are safe. Anyways, so the idea would be like you know, now the big talks about solution. Of course, man, and, and again, I, if I quote the prime minister of Bangladesh, and I'm not a big fan. I mean, I'm, I need to say I don't have any political allegiance. I just, I'm a researcher and I need to tell the truth to the best of my ability. So prime minister was talking to say like, look, that we have tried, but not a single Rohingya has been re repatriated. So his hard comment to the United Nations was, the problem was created by Myanmar and its solution must be found in Myanmar. I request the international community to play a more effective role for a solution to the crisis. But the international community never listened they're thinking that you know, if they put a small bit of like you know, donor money, aid money, that will probably keep Bangladeshis or Bangladeshi government like, you know, what do you call, happy and like, you know, quiet. As I said, I listen to many people who say like, you know, look, Bangladesh is making a lot of money. And if you listen to Bangladeshi community, that also need to be listened and heard. Bangladeshi people are saying that there's a decline in aid money. Bangladesh government tries to say, look, we will give you double this money, take this refugee from us. Whether this is a political double standard, I do not know. Of course, they need further research. If they're making the most out of this Rohingya crisis, refugee crisis, this is not fair either. But if it is not true, then it is, needs to be taken like in a more holistic approach. Not a single country in this world, let alone America or Germany or like in other bigger countries or UK, can shelter literally one, nearly a million people with this much of like um, resources scarcity, right? Bangladesh is not a rich country. It's not like, it's not a country. I mean, I tell to my students, Bangladesh is slightly bigger than England, much smaller than whole of the United Kingdom with 170 million population, that's official. Probably the population is even, even more than that. How could they have 1 million people? The world needs to understand this. Relocation, to another part of Bangladesh is a theoretical thing, but there's not enough place in Bangladesh where they can be relocated. Ben probably have seen Bangladesh, right? You have seen Dhaka, where they will be relocated. So all these theoretical discussions and solutions make no sense whatsoever. If there's a third party solution, not enough country, not another country in five years time have taken enough Rohingyas to say, look, we will play this part. We'll share our responsibilities. So there needs to be like a quick revisit there needs to be like, if I use both this term, radical questioning need to be made. What international community is doing is probably not right. If Bangladesh is playing a double standard, that needs to be investigated. But on the face of it, we, I can confidently say that Rohingyas want to return. Yes, they want citizenship. Some, some do, some don't. Yes, they want safety and security because that's basic human needs, right? They need, to, this is their country. Nobody has ever told that Rohingyas are not the Myanmar citizens. Yeah? And Rohingyas are getting involved in criminal activities. Not only they try to go for like, you know, what do you call, um, another country for their like, you know, betterment, or they're spreading within Bangladesh, right? They're taking risky journeys. They'll probably take risky journeys to come to Europe. Now it is like you know, limited to Southeast Asia, maybe. They're involved in drug peddling, which is not good at all. They're involved in like you know, terrorist activities and rape and other petty activities are making the host communities increasingly hostile about them. Imagine when they will turn violent, if they become violent, that will be a massive issue and the crisis will take a new dimension. Probably there'll be a new flow of aid again, but that will not solve the crisis in the long term. Yeah, um, I, this, is, this, is my personal, this is my personal and passionate experience. Um, I'm a passionate person. I'm not ashamed of like, you know, to infuse my passion, what I say, but I pr probably better that and I stop there and if there's a, and let other learn from other colleagues and take any questions the um, audience may have. Thank you for the opportunity.
Yeah, again, also, um, thanks a lot, Palash, for this uh, very critical and uh, very important um, remarks and background information. Also, yeah, uh, raising again, I think the, the, the really crucial crucial aspect of like the real politics behind it, the geopolitical dimension of what seems like a local situation, but is a situation that is embedded in yeah, larger, larger networks um, of, of political, let's say, um uh ge geo geopolitical interests that are that are there or that are might might not be there and that actually sort of the humanitarian crisis that um organizations like rsc actually deal with sort of are indeed political crisis um you already mentioned some of the the, the, the pathways that um displaced rohingyas might take um so it's for, for many it's clear it's also been mentioned for from um, by Nupur, um, those who are have been relocated to Bashanchar, um, sort of there's barriers to mobility for displaced Rohingyas. Many try to leave the island again. Many also are mobile within Bangladesh, um, but many move on to other countries um, um, as well um, through different pathways. And this is an aspect that uh, now Antje Misbach will address. Um, Antje Misbach is professor of sociology at Bielefeld University, um, working on global and transnational migration and mobility. Um, she's author of a range of books um, on separatist conflict in Indonesia and on transit asylum seekers who are stuck in Indonesia. In her latest book, the, appeared this year, The Criminalization of People Smuggling in Indonesia and Australia, Asylum Out of Reach. Um, Anche, so you have worked extensively on displacement dynam dynamics and mobilities in Southeast Asia, and recently you've worked on Rohingya's maritime escapes, um, so the pathways people take through the Andaman Sea. Um, you said also you would like to talk, say a few words about the solutions preferred by displaced Rohingyas themselves and what strategies they follow trying to achieve them. So from your perspective, what is the role of mobility in this? And is mobility um, now to Malaysia and this Indonesia part of a solution or part of a problem? <laughs> thank you, Benjamin. Um, and thank you all to the previous speaker. It was very interesting to listen to you. Now, I will concentrate my remarks on um, those people who are basically uh, voting with their feet, people who don't see uh, any viable perspective for themselves in the camps and those who do not uh, assume that uh, re uh, resettlement or repatriation is going to happen any moment soon. Now, um, maybe we can start with the first slide. Um, on this map, you can see that uh, even before the 2017 exodus, uh, Rohingya have been fairly mobile, um, uh, trying to reach other countries uh, on a temporary or permanent basis, often um, uh, in, in form of um, labor migrants um, or uh, asylum seekers. Now, as you know, for people who don't have citizenship, uh, regular travel is often very difficult. And so they are much more pushed into the hands of those facilitators who can turn out to be very exploitative. But I thought I'm going to show you uh, these numbers, even if they're not entirely maybe up to date. Um, it is uh, quite astonishing to see the existing mobility. Now, one of the latest places that have become really um, of interest uh, is uh, Malaysia. So we can say over the last uh, uh, 10 years, maybe 120, 150,000 have actually migrated to Malaysia. Um, can we have the next slide, please? And um, there are basically two main roads how people travel uh, from uh, either uh, Bangladesh or also nowadays more often from Myanmar uh, to Malaysia. Now, there are the uh, land routes and uh, the routes via sea. Both are risky, both are uh, dangerous, and both has uh, resulted in a number of facilities. Now, um, uh, fatality, sorry. Um, so, the other thing is that uh, huge distances need to be uh, crossed and those journeys, they can often take not just weeks, but actually uh, months because people held um, hostage, held uh, at a ransom by those people who had actually promised them um, to facilitate journeys. We have seen large scale corruption, large scale involvement in, in Thailand uh, amongst uh, local authorities, including both uh, military, but also um, 
non-military uh, officials earning and 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 uh, making um, huge benefits from moving um, the uh, Rohingya. Next slide, please. Um, in 2015, preceding the Andaman Sea crisis, um, was the discovery of like uh, mass graves first uh, north of the Thai Malaysian border, um, and then a few weeks later also south of the border. Now these bodies most likely belong to Rohingya, but also in some cases to Bangladesh um, victims of the people smuggling and trafficking, as you like. Um, Altogether, more than 140 graves have been uh, found. Uh, as part of the discovery was a massive push of those people who were already on their way to Malaysia onto boats. And uh, next slide, please. What we saw in 2015, which is often referred to as the Andaman Sea crisis, is that uh, smugglers put people on boats and those boats were stuck in the Andaman Sea because um, at first neither Thailand nor Indonesia nor Malaysia wanted to receive uh, those people on, on the boat. And um, some people have retraced the journeys of boats and, and often uh, authorities spoke of human ping pong. It was only in late May 2015 and also due to international attention directed at these three potential uh, receiving countries that uh, at least Malaysia and Indonesia agreed to bring these people on land and to uh, provide them shelter. However, this agreement was based on some very short-lived um, conditions. First of all, um, those people rescued need to be resettled elsewhere, so not Indonesia, not Malaysia, uh, within one year, and all costs had to be covered by the UNHCR or external donors. So the hospitality came with very strong limits. Now, um, next slide, please. This was actually um, not the very first time, uh, next slide, please, that we have seen pushbacks. Um, there are there's quite uh, convincing evidence that pushbacks have happened since 2009. Um, uh, surrounding um, countries have agreed to this kind of silent left to die policies. Um, ignoring calls for help. Um, so even if there's no active pushback, ignoring or preventing people from disembarking at land, in a way has the same effect. And what we have seen uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, when there was a renewed um, effort by people trying to come to Malaysia is that um, they have been uh, pushed back and held at sea. So Malaysia has bragged um, to have pushed back at least 20 boats only uh, in 2020. It's very hard to verify uh, these, these data. Um, there's very uh, little um, uh, we can do. Um, often also because if people are eventually pushed back and maybe end up in, in Bangladesh again, um, they are immediately detained and, and not having access to these people makes it really difficult to, to get proper numbers also about potential fatalities um, that may have resulted from these journeys. Um, one aspect before I stop that I really wanted to alert you to, next slide please, is that um, as part of these um, hostile uh, receptions by the Southeast Asian countries is that um, we can now see that not only are boats being pushed back, but also people who have been involved in their rescue. And here I'm mostly talking about non-state authorities, primarily uh, fishermen, that they are now also facing um, criminal uh, investigation and, and uh, punishment. So there's a huge discouragement now being sent out because um, Indonesian uh, fishermen have gone to jail under Indonesian legislation. Um, the minimum sentence for people smuggling is five years. And that, in a way, has yet uh, added another layer to the many risks of those people who are trying to flee from Bangladesh, flying, uh, trying to flee from Myanmar. Because even if they come across um, fishermen or those who could hand some help over to them, they might no longer do so. They might maybe direct them to the nearest island, to the nearest shore, but they will not pull their boats. So in a way, we see that the, um, yeah, the criminalization of, of rescuers or the criminalization um, of um, civil civilian support um, and, and uh, the pretense that these perpetrators are now involved in transnational crime has made, yeah, 
the journey is much more uh, dangerous. It's not a unique phenomena that we can see in the Andaman Sea happening. Uh, of course, there are many similarities that we can see in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, yeah, I might as I might as well just um, stop here, maybe by saying that even for those people who are rescued, who are allowed to disembark, uh, they often end up in detention centers, both in Indonesia and in Malaysia. So in a way, the camp life that they wanted to escape in, in Bangladesh is um, continued in those uh, potential uh, host countries. Um, the punitive treatment uh, of victims of violence is um, continued. I, I leave it here. Um, I don't know. I mean, I pretty much agree with what other people have said about potential uh, prospects for where to from here. Um, putting a prime focus on, on Rohingyas themselves and letting them decide might probably be the best. And I don't think that we can see a one and only solution. There's probably a combination of solutions that consists of some resettlement, maybe some repatriations, but also um, integration in yeah, local host communities in, in the long run. So I think it's gonna be a much more staggered approach. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, Antje, for this um, very important contribution, pointing us to the dimension beyond beyond Bangladesh and um, how people yeah, are, are embarking on very dangerous, very risky journeys towards other countries and the risks they encounter encounter in this and clearly noting that this yeah mobility um yeah it seems like an another escape um but it's not a solution in itself but what you pointed uh, a point that you raised um uh, one of the last aspects of that people are then continuing um their journey of being living in a protracted situation if they are then stuck on a boat and then people are again stuck again in detention camps uh, without adequate um, aspects of yeah, finding access to work, to livelihoods, to citizenship, uh, in, in fact, um, so that these journeys are not only physical journeys, but sort of journeys, continued experience, of being marginalized, being excluded, not being and becoming part of something anew. Um, here would like um, so just as an intermediate comment, sort of if um, in the audience, sort of if you have any questions, if you have particular comments, if you want to uh, raise a particular issue, uh, please don't hesitate to write your comment um, in the F&A or Q&A um, section, and we will uh, discuss them after this, um, this last input. Um, so I would like to turn to um, Anas Ansar, who is a PhD candidate and research associate at Bonn Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies at the University of Bonn um, here in Germany. Um, he's PhD research investigates Rohingya refugees' labor market participation in host countries. And uh, he's also doing multi sided um, research. So he has worked extensively in Bangladesh and recently in Malaysia and Thailand. Um, so currently, he's joining us today from the University of Fribourg from Switzerland, where he's also a junior research fellow and uh, investigates the nexus between digital technologies and Rohingya's. Um, diasporas, social and political transformations. Um, so Anas, in our pre-talk, you, you said you would like to review also the role of the transnational Rohingya diaspora um, and their engagement with this current situation and their contribution towards finding durable solution. Um, so in addition to what we heard so far, I mean, might there be a place for the diaspora to support or to provide alternative and complement pathways to more sustainable futures. Um, can you give us maybe some examples from your recent research in Malaysia on how such transnational networks can help um, in reaching durable solutions? We'd be curious to hear. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, you can also address any of the other points <laughs> from, yeah. <laughs> sure. uh, if you want to react on something that Nupur or Palash or Antje already mentioned. No, uh, well, um, um, uh, um, how to start? I think I will, um, yeah, probably just uh, to react to the some of the, the discussions that we have had already. Um, I think it's not a reaction, rather kind of like uh, uh, contribution further. 
I think we talked about the failure of the UN uh, and the whole uh, uh, failure of the Bangladesh government in particular, kind of like to really uh, um, uh, engage effectively with the international community to bring a solution to 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 this protracted crisis so so, so very briefly two particular points uh, number one is on this whole notion of internationalization that we have been talking that international community international community i think uh, this idea of international community is no more there it's not in Southeast Asia or Africa or Middle East or Europe, it's nowhere. So that very notion of international community that we have seen in the early 1990s until 2000, that like in, in different crises, for example, in, in Kosovo, in, in former Yugoslavia, in many parts of uh, the Middle East, uh, the more, we are approaching to a future. I, I, I'm like I might be very cynical, but there is a clear uh, uh, kind of like erosion of this whole notion of international community, and in particular the credibility of the of the UN, uh, which is slowly but persistently, I emphasize, persistently decreasing. Be it in the case of Myanmar. Uh, not just the Rohingya issue, but even what's going on in Myanmar following the military coup since February 2021. Even the day before, there were like 80 uh, uh, Kareni uh, uh, activists were uh, uh, killed by, from air uh, uh, attack by the military regime. So, I mean, it's just the everyday news and uh, we, we see nothing. Um, and be it in the case of Syria and Ethiopia, like you just name it. So the question is, this is something probably we need to rethink when it comes to talk about a solution to the Rohingya crisis in particular, as we are talking about this particular crisis today. And um, it might be a bit provocative, what I'm going to suggest. And, uh, and it might also contradict what Many of uh, some of our the the, the eminent experts uh, uh, already uh, mentioned, uh, especially the role of India, the role of China. I mean, we agree or not, but I think uh, without having these regional authorities, these uh, powerful states, key players of the region uh, like China, like India, if if they don't. If we can't make them have them on board to to have a solution to the Rohingya crisis, I think uh, 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 it might it might it might linger further and 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 uh, and, and there is clearly a lack of uh, strategies um, uh, when it comes to engaging with the with the regional partners with the regional players, and there I come to this public diplomacy, which is the diaspora, right? Which I'm working on. So what I do is I'm trying to map the, the different uh, exiled Rohingya organizations based in Europe, in Australia, in North America, in Malaysia, and in Bangladesh. Uh, how do they actually, uh, what, what role they play in this whole crisis and how do they contribute to, towards a solution to this protracted crisis, right? I mean, um, so, so, so there are two dimensions on that. I mean, like, I think one is clear that like this diaspora has been playing a very important role to, to sort of create a transnational identity to 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 keep to keep the topic alive which is equally important kind of like so there are uh, occasions where the rohingya diasporas are kind of like organizing uh, global events engaging through various platforms particularly if, uh, when the the case uh, 
in at in ICJ International Court of Justice between Myanmar and and and, and Gambia took place. There was a huge online uh, uh, political mobilization that took place thanks to this diaspora. Uh, so 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 clearly there is a big big uh, impact of how diaspora is kind of linking with the issues how diaspora is lobbying with, with different actors and how these diasporas are kind of like constantly reminding us what's, what happened wrong and what we should do. So, so that is about the, the diaspora's engagement. And now I come to the problem with this diaspora again. So, as I, as, I, as, I, as I started with this whole internationalization, I think there comes the problem that like you have been knocking on the wrong doors. So the UN is no more a solution. I give an example of Vashanchor again, because many of you have genuine concern about Vashanchor, right? I mean, because it's a low-lying island, it's a, it's a place that might be disappeared in the next 30 years. Again, there are hundreds of such islands in Bangladesh where the Bangladeshis themselves are living. Let's not forget that. Where the Bangladeshis themselves are living. So what Bangladesh do within its capacity is doing its best. I think I, on, on a very different note, let me also acknowledge that despite many problems, so what happened with this whole Vashanchar uh, episode is when the Bangladesh government requested the Rohingyas, hey, there is a better facility. I quote, I, I keep it within the quotation, better facility. And Nupurapa already mentioned that this is actually in, in terms of infrastructure, it is way better than the refugee camps in Cox's Bazar. I have been to Vashanchar several times uh, so I know the difference. And I, by the way, I am, I am a local from Cox's Bazaar. So that's another important thing. And, and it's, uh, it's all the Rohingya language is, is my mother tongue. So, um, it's, so I can be also a bit of the hair comes a bit of insider reflection. Um, so what I wanted to say about this Vashantir episode and the problem with this, uh, with, with, with the, the whole public diplomacy or the, how the Rohingya diaspora engages, is when the Bangladesh government requested them, let's move on. There was a huge outcry and there was huge protest. And uh, there was like regular protest in the refugee camps. And for two months, nothing happened. Bangladesh failed to actually relocate except probably 200 refugees. And then the Bangladesh government decided to tighten up the whole funding that UN uh, is uh, spending on. So there were some particular funding coming from abroad were restricted by the Bangladesh government, especially for the UNHCR and the IOM. And at one point, IOM had to come to terms and the UNHCR had to come to terms with the Bangladesh government. And they decided to actually disburse funding not only in the refugee camps in Cox's Bazar, but also promised Bangladesh government that they will also spend part of their, their, their funding in, the, in, in, in this, in Vashanchor. So which means that like Vashanchor is kind of now officially acknowledged by the UN agencies that like, okay, this is something we, where we need to work. And they approached the, the Rohingya, Rohingya community and they immediately said, oh yes, you're going because you are, the, you are the one whom we trust. So as UN said, then now suddenly we have, we have probably more than 50,000 Rohingyas uh, moved to Pashanchor. So do you see the problem? This is clearly a problem. I mean, come on. I mean, let's, 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 let, let's accept it. I mean, we are talking about a country uh, we are talking about a regime that deals with the with with this crisis, and you are bypassing them, and 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 hoping your master will come up with a big solution. And you just what you have been kind of like 
constantly opposing for three, four months. And overnight you decided, okay, now that you went going there, so this is a place, part of heaven, I can go there. So that's not how things work. And there comes a big, big question on the whole notion of public diplomacy. So the Rohingya community, uh, especially those are outside Bangladesh who have been very vocal, they somehow either tend to ignore the local uh, kind of constraints and how things work in the refugee camp, or they have their own agenda on, 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 on how to engage with this uh, issue. So which clearly creates a, a fracture uh, between various stakeholders, namely Bangladesh government, Bangladeshi population, Bangladeshi media, and the Rohingya refugees living there. And, uh, and, 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 and this, is, this is a concern that has been penetrated by the media that likes, hey, see, this is what's going on, right? I mean, we have a government, but the government decision was bypassed by this community. So, so all these tensions are there. And, uh, and um, one last thing probably to add on is the figure, because all of you have mentioned about 900 something thousand. So it's less than a million figure, right? Officially, but if you look at the government statistics, it's 1.3 million. I mean, I can send you the link. So, so, so why this, why this politics of also with the numbers, right? I mean, why you have to show less figure of Rohingyas living in Bangladesh, while the, why the government would kind of like emphasize there are more than what is estimated by the UN. So why this politics with statistics, right? Why this politics with uh, uh, like who has what stakes to say in this crisis like this? So there is this also this parallel governance and fracture between the Bangladesh government and the UN agencies, which further kind of problematizing the whole uh, process of working towards a, a, a solution to this uh, protracted crisis. As I mentioned, I might be very provocative here. And, uh, um, and, 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 and I think this is what I would very briefly uh, uh, put here. And uh, yeah, I'm open to, to more questions and probably further discussion. Yeah, thank you. Okay, also um, Anash Onik uh, Dundubat, thanks a lot for these very critical, important reflections. I think sort of we're, yeah, we're covering a whole lot of space uh, here. Uh, each of you raised it, has, has risen many, many important um, facets of the situation. Um, Nupur, um, do you, can you um, turn on your camera again? And um, maybe first sort of we um, give, give um, us again an opportunity to react uh, to one another. Um, if there's something that you would want to react to um, directly, uh, would be interesting to to hear from from you now. Sort of your what what impressions you have had and gathered now through the um, critical um, reflections by our academic colleagues. Thank you. I don't like to react actually, uh, but uh, from the very beginning of this influx, uh, I am working with this crisis. So, and every time when I go to camps, I see children are here and there, and they are moving around without uh, any proper clothes, uh, without any um, uh, in, uh, 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 play instruments, uh, without any sandals or shoes in their uh, uh, in their uh, legs or foot, and also we see I see or we see youth community they are sitting ideally. Uh, without doing anything and everyone, almost everyone has a cell phone or mobile phone in their hand and they are using uh, or browsing Facebook or websites. And uh, whenever I go to camp, I meet uh, women. And last time I met a woman who is around 28 years and uh, already she has four children. And the last children's uh, 
me uh, was hardly uh, eight or nine months. And after after having that uh, children, uh, her uh, husband left him her and uh, went to another camp and got married and uh, divorced her. And she was not aware that she was divorced by her husband. And after four or five months, when uh, he she was not able to communicate with her husband, she asked uh, her neighbor uh, neighbor. Uh, uh, neighbor women, uh, what happened? Why my husband is not coming? And then that lady said that uh, your husband uh, divorced you. And and after having this uh, uh, conversation, uh, when I look at her eyes, I didn't see any light. And her older, my elder children, whose age is eight years, he is looking after the whole family in camps. So I don't see any future of them and they don't also see any future or any light of the of their they don't have any hope of their future and this is not our crisis our means that not bangladesh crisis this is the crisis for myanmar this is the regional crisis this is also global crisis and those and the solution is not here in bangladesh the solution is lied to myanmar and they must take action to solve the the crisis and 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 ensure that environment where Rohingya community can go back to their uh, to their estate and stay there safely, as per their uh, uh, conditions, and also the role of regional uh, leaders are uh, global global community. I know uh, uh, Anas mentioned like there is no such global community, but uh, still uh, there are power power uh, power players in at global level, and they have role, and they cannot ignore or bypass that role. Uh, to solve this crisis. So until and unless uh, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar authorities are not taking action, regional uh, players and global power players who are not taking action, we cannot solve this problem here in Bangladesh for, by our own. And uh, every year around 30,000 children are born in, in, uh, in camps and the population is growing up. And uh, only we have only around four five hundred thousand uh, Bangladesh communities in Cox's Bazar, and they are living in a very congested, overcrowded camp. So, how this number of population can stay for a longer time in 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 Cox's Bazar, and how far we can bear this burden? Because the uh, the fund is declining, and uh, the war between uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine is affecting our economics. So everything is money, making a more burden or crisis for us. So we must take uh, we must take action. We must play our we means everyone. Every uh, power uh, leaders, every uh, every actors from country to Myanmar to ASEAN to global to play their part. So therefore, Myanmar authorities take action and and solve the crisis in their country. And therefore, Myanmar Rohingya refugee can go back to their estate and children who are here, young people who are here, sitting ideally without any hope, without any light, they can see the light and hope. And, and and make their own future. I just wanted to say this one. Okay, thank you, thank you, um, Nupur. But because it has um, has been um, raised again, also in 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 the, in the chat, uh, maybe one of you, um, uh, Palash or Anas, can elaborate a bit more on this question of um, the the relations, the actual relations between sort of um, local Bangladeshi communities and displaced displaced Rohingyas. What kind of the dynamics um, have been there. Um, the the question um, posed in the in in the chat was or comment looking at African countries such as Uganda, which is a small and poor country but has what can be described as a welcoming and generous refugee policy. I'm wondering about what appears to be a lack of solidarity with the Rohingya refugees among Asian countries. Could there be other explanations for this beyond the financial burden um, of hosting refugees? So. Um, yeah, maybe one of you wants to share something about this notion of yeah, living together, of solidarity, or the moments, um, Palash, you started to describe it, sort of the, the moments in how far sort of this initial support and solidarity might has turned or uh, continues to turn um, maybe into uh, hostility. So 
um, to give a bit more background would be appreciated. Thanks. And then there's also another question later. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very good point. And I really, I really like me appreciate the question has been raised. And I read, I've just read like, you know, what Anas has typed. So the question is open for interpretation. And open, it's a subjective question. So apparently, I think like you know, there possibly is the view that there is not enough solidarity. If everybody wants to kick, kick them out, if nobody willing to take them, right? There seems to be a lack of solidarity. And um, I'm not sure I have understood this question correctly, but um, I think there might be a connotation, like you know, there might be some nuance in it that like, you know, that there, there is a, there is a like a negative representation of the Rohingyas, right? In, in global media, especially in like you know, local media, um, region, local, I mean, regional Southeast Asian or South Asian media. Um, the Rohingyas are like you know, very, um, in, in, in Chittagongian terms, Anas is here, like bad dogs, like you know, very arrogant, very rude, right? And they're like, you know, they're very like, you know, they're highly, highly, um, their population, they're like, you know, they're like a very productive kind of population. They're, um, um, the birth rate is quite staggering, right? As Nupurapa was saying, like, you know, there's a, a significant number of children is being born every year. Even in this situation, like you know, when their like, you know, life is, is not great, to be to be to be to be honest, right? They're involved in criminal activities. Like, you know, has this been the like you know, connotation? I'm not sure. And if you look at like you know the news um, news that Indian newspapers and televisions give them, it's pretty much the same. Like, you know, that they're that portrayed as a group of people who are like unproductive, illiterate, um, laden with religious values, who like you know, who are like you know, willing to expand their families, like you know, like without thinking of anything. So that could be one thing. So there might be like, you no, know, there is of course negative representation. Representation does matter, right? That if these are the people like you know, who have off no use or whatsoever, if they're arrogant, if they're like you know, um, I, a lazy people or like if they're like you know, coming here to reproduce more and like, you know, ruin our culture and all these things, it's, it's not going anywhere. The other one, I personally think there's no lack of solidarity and um, Anas has responded in this way that there's no lack of solidarity to be honest. It's probably the, if there is any lack of solidarity is because there is no ge geopolitical interest involved in this. Nobody gets anything by supporting the Rohingyas, right? If you rather support, like if you rather quiet silent, you still can do a lot of business with Myanmar. So the religious proximity, like, you know, because Indonesia is a Muslim country, and of course, like, you know, these countries are Muslim countries, and they have huge trade relationship with Myanmar. They have huge trade relationship with India and China, right? So protesting and angering them and showing stronger support rather than like you know, rather than on paper rhetorical support will cost their economy dearly, rather than like you know, they will gain anything, right? And that's why you see like you know, in the OIC case, the Gambia has brought this issue. OIC is not very active either. I accept like you know I mean I'm not accepting it, but I, I appreciate what Anas is saying that there is no international community. Even's role is declining. Of course, the roles decline they're biased. If it was like in a different community, you would have been like, an act like not a paper, paper tiger, a real tiger, right? What is, where is OIC in this case? I mean, I would rather like a like, you know, holistic perspective. It's not even to support the Muslims. OIC should have played a much, much stronger, much vocal role too. It hasn't. So if there is any lack of solidarity is because probably because there is no geopolitical interest. Nobody wants to anger China, India, and to some extent Russia. Myanmar, after all these years of sanction, I mean, I still remember a BBC interview. The first company that went to Myanmar was Coca-Cola. And the interviewer asked, like, why it took so it was such a week. It's like you know, five in a huge population, untapped market. And Coca-Cola wanted to give the test, taste to the Myanmar citizens, which people were dying without having, right? So it's like a you know, free market, free economy. It's a huge market. People want does people want to increase trade with Myanmar? And as you can see, after this genocide, after the military coup, the world is trading with Myanmar pretty much as business as usual. Yeah. Why they would bother to take these people back? Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably my my response. But like I said, I may have not got the answer um, question correctly. But if yeah. I got this question in this way. That would be my response. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Palash. Um, Antje, you have to leave in a second. So I would just quickly like to uh, uh, answer, like, like to answer you on this aspect of solidarity or sort of 
yeah, ab ability or willingness, political willingness of countries in Southeast Asia in, in their response uh, yeah. to the situation, also in terms of a local integration, inclusion, opening up pathways sort of from on the basis of your work you have done in Indonesia and Malaysia. Yeah, thanks. Well, I mean, probably just to add to the previous speaker, uh, all the solidarity which is extended tends to be a uh, send away from the host country. So, in particular, Indonesian NGOs and Malaysian interviews, they have been, uh, NGOs have been very vocal and they have been actually able to collect a lot of donations uh, during Rich's um, holidays, but with the intention to send humanitarian aid to the camps. So, if there is uh, Muslim solidarity, which is often the battle cry, so to say, then it's for people far away, not for those who are already in Indonesia or who have reached Malaysia. So it's I, in a way like the kind of anti-migrant, anti-refugee sentiments that play out. Um, and often these kind of uh, donations have happened um, also in order to, for example, strengthen Indonesian aid politics. So there was an urge to, for Indonesia to create um, uh, a name, a reputation as provider and not just recipient of aid. So what we see, um, limited uh, solidarity is definitely, but also a lot of uh, empty rhetoric. Um, now, but despite all these um, obvious um, rejection, I do think that uh, some people basically have also managed to mingle through. And we will always find uh, a couple of uh, individuals who end up marrying locally, um, who blend in, who learn the language, who for some reason manage to carve out um, a living. And I'm often very impressed by these people who can, despite all the obstacles, uh, open a kiosk, uh, send their kids to school, become a teacher for uh, Arabic in some uh, mosque. So I'm, I think despite all the criticism, all about uh, the pointing out to what is missing it's probably also good to acknowledge some uh, of the people who have shown maybe extraordinary uh, amounts of resilience. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for, for this um, assessment, um, Antje. Um, so there's still another question in the chat that I want to raise your attention to again. Um, the, the, the question sort of again, what the role of um, the UN, UNHCR, UNHCR uh, has been in supporting Rohingyas um, and whether you can point to most important um, reports. Um, so as not everybody can see the, the chat, maybe um, one of you can also quickly address that um, orally. Did you get the point? I don't know. Um, again, Nupur or, or Anas, I think you have already um, re responded, sort of that you can, you can, you can. Uh, you thank can you. Share. Uh, regarding the report, there are several reports uh, are, uh, are produced by UNHCR and other agencies. We can share. Uh, I just asked uh, uh, email ID. I can share yeah. through email. Uh, regarding the role of UNHCR in Bangladesh, uh, they actually they are uh, uh, looking for they are uh, working with uh, government uh, to look at the protection situation of uh, this Rohingya refugee in Bangladesh, uh, including the registration. Uh, they are uh, they are covering and collaborating with Bangladesh government, and uh, and also uh, they are uh, uh, they are. Coordinating with ISG intersection intersectorial coordinating group uh, to manage or to coordinate the whole crisis in Bangladesh. This is the overarching uh, overarching role of UNHCR in Bangladesh, and there are particular roles. So, so if you are interested, then we may have one to one conversation. It takes time, maybe. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can I can put you I can put the the, the people person who's uh, ask a question and you into contact. Sure. I have your emails addresses. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Okay. Be before we close, um, I would have a quick question my myself. Um, so I think w one of you, I can't recall who already mentioned it, but sort of that again, we have had um, killings of Rohingya leaders in the camps. Uh, I noted it was in Al Jazeera, I think two weeks ago or so, or, or a week ago, when again two um, yeah, refugee leaders were, were shot in one of the camps. 
Um, can you? I just simply don't understand. Can you explain what what's what's one of you explain what's the what's the reason behind such killings? And this is it sort of um, people are there rifts within the Rohingya communities, or is it sort of um, this um, violence from members? Bangladeshi members towards these Rohingya leaders were these people who stood up against sort of the the, the, the economy of violence regarding the trade of, um, of, of, of drugs and other criminal activities um, would be um, interested to hear an assessment by one of you. Yeah, probably I can add something on that. Yeah, very briefly, uh, I think there is two uh, um, sort of like um, uh, polarized groups. One is anti-repatriation and the other one is pro-repatriation. Um, I mean, it's again very vague what is anti-repatriation and pro-repatriation. So Mohibullah was kind of like uh, a champion uh, who was engaging with, with, with different actors and kind of also raising this whole, uh, like he had this a movement called Let's Go Home. So he is the one who was clearly pointing out that what, where the solution lies, which is returning back uh, to, to the Rakhine state. And there are other, there is this other group, which is, again, um, it might be very problematic to say, but like kind of like, uh, we call them Al Yakin group. Uh, it's kind of an uh, a wing of uh, ARSA, Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, and uh, and they are um, kind of like in 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 recent uh, months and years there are plenty of reports, uh, even coming from Rohingya community themselves, that like how this uh, like small uh, armed group is kind of like creating horrors within the within the camps and if you remember what mrs nupur uh, miss nupur mentioned at the beginning that like they have to leave the camp within 3 p.m so which means after 3 p.m or let's say 5 p.m someone else control the camps and control over a million people so 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 there are a lot of the stories going on what happens after the sunset right so that the, the sunset government the government before and after the sunset. I mean, that speaks a lot about this division uh, in, in, in the camps and, uh, and, and, and killing of Mohibullah is one of the outcomes of such uh, division in the camps. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot um, for, for this um, explanation. I mean, of course, uh, making us aware again, sort of that yeah, we cannot speak about the Rohingya community um, as such. There are many different positions, political positions, there are gendered um, positions that Nupu pointed to. Um, so there's also different religious groups um, within the Rohingya groups, and, and people are in a very different position depending on the place. And may I come in for a minute? Up. Yep. I just wanted to share uh, one more uh, aspect here, which is the voice of Rohingya refugees who are here in uh, Cox's Bazaar. Uh, mm -hmm. Very often we talk uh, on behalf of them, like I am here, or we are here to talk on behalf of them. And uh, we produce several study report or, uh, or documents or conferences, but very, uh, very often we miss to engage them very often we miss to invite them. So it's really important uh, to, to listen to them directly, not on behalf of them, and need to create a space so that they can come and they can share their uh, uh, voices, thoughts, or expectations, which may make uh, their life easier in, in some points. And regarding the killing or safety security issue, it's all about power. Uh, some group wants to control the whole camps and some don't want to. So it's a, it's a power game between two or three groups. Over to you. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, sort of our time, our, our time is up. Um, but uh, the, the point that you just raised, Nupur, is a question about representation and also representation in a webinar um, like this um, is a very important and valid one. And um, try to contact a few people, but it didn't work out that um, some people uh, who have been 
who are identify themselves as part of the Rohingya community um, actually take an active role in this webinar. Um, but yeah, I think also for us, so this is a, a learning and uh, we want to in, enhance further debate also on this on this topic um, and uh, include you again in further discussions um, to learn from one another. Um, and we will be uh, inc try to be as inclusive as possible and to reach out to many stakeholders and, and people who are interested in this field as possible in, in the future. Um, so I hope that it didn't come across as very exclusive um, today. Um, so even though we um, sort of you raised so many points, each, each of you that each of them could be discussed for another hour or so. Um, so let, let's close it for now. Um, um, I would thank you a lot for, for giving us the opportunity to learn from your own work, from your research, from your critical insights um, uh, has been extremely fruitful. Uh, for me at least, <laughs> so just being very selfish here. I hope it was also entertaining to people in the audience. And yeah, just thank you a lot and we will um, stay in touch. And um, to also in closing the audience, if you have further questions about the FFVT project, please um, approach us and um, you see the website ffvt.net. Um, and there's also opportunity for fellowships uh, in our project and yeah, We'll be interested in further discussions on this and related topics. Thanks a lot. Um, Thank have a you. nice evening in Bangladesh and a nice afternoon in Europe. Um, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good evening from Bangladesh. Thank you. It's the same. Bye.